Hello everyone and welcome back to the Covenant Cast. I'm your host Zach. And I'm Steven and today we're talking about a little bit about Gen Con. We're going to get into some things we're looking forward to or at least I'm looking forward What's to. coming up? I've also got some previews that went up for a couple of the games that we support and continuing actually with a little bit of Netrunner commentary. Quite a few uh, Netrunner questions we can. coming through yeah. on the, uh, the old comments. So stick with us. we got more coming. <laughs> all right, we're back. How was Fourth of July? I told you about to say all right, but you just did it. Fourth of July, was, <laughs> dude. Fourth of July was good. I went to Manhattan, Kansas. Saw my my friend Brian. I think I've talked about on the cast before. And he's got a house up there. He got his. He he went through the ringer, uh, which is worth mentioning for any younger audience members out there, potentially uh, fathers or mothers listening that have children who are looking to do anything exciting or, I guess, ambitious with their life. He got a. He went to college with me at OSU, and then he went into a program that was become a vet and get your PhD in parasitology at the same time, uh, which, as you can imagine, is extensive. Yeah, but so, he's, a, he's a really smart guy. Very smart. Um, it, it took him like six years in total, I think. And so you have to be aware that there's that moment in time when all of the people that you've spent all of your time with generally just go away, and then you're stuck there for like almost twice the amount of time, or at least like 150% more time than you already had spent there. And that can get a little draggy. So I'm very happy that he has gotten past that phase. Like he was stuck in college town. Yeah, and it's like, ah, oh, still here. Yeah, when you turn college, 30 and you're in college, it's like going to college bars, you know, and dealing with people who are like 19 and 20, um, which of course they're fine, but it's just a different <laughs> space. Uh, so so he's Almost out and he went to Manhattan uh, with a, a very Kansas. nice gal, uh, Livy. And yeah, so they're doing their <coughs> stuff, they're doing vet stuff, and he's doing research in the lab. Had all of our kind of old friend group up for uh, Fourth of July, and it was great. Has a beautiful house that he's bought. It's just like nice. really cool. So it was a, it was a great time. No fireworks or anything, but it was good. What, what did it have to do with parents? Um, just like you know, if you have kids who are considering the track that, that, that is yeah. uh, you know a pretty extensive post college op opportunity, to uh, warn them. that takes a lot of time. Yeah. And that's a lot of opportunity that you're not getting in the real world. Uh, so, you know. But, you know, you're still doing your pluses thing. Pluses and minuses, strikes and gutters, but it's now paying off for him big time. So it, it does, if you can get there, it, it works out. All right. Very cool. Yeah, uh, what about you? Fourth? Fourth of family. July? You know what the Fourth Loads of July is called in, in countries that aren't America? Fourth of July. That's correct. <laughs> Nailed Thank it. You. Uh, yeah, Fourth of July was it was great. Um, we were in uh, saga set mode. That's right. Uh, going into that, so I had a pretty extensive build up to that. The moment. opposite of independence, ultimately, on Independence Day, because you were tied to the uh, the saga set production. Yoke. Uh, well, by by Independence Day though, I was just with family, my Number family, three. my fiance's family. Uh, which was good, but I was just like exhausted, and then it was a full day of activities. So it what's was fun. The, what's the bun, what's the Bun family Independence Day? <laughs> How like? does that go? Tell me that. Uh, so my mom and dad, I grew up. We both grew up in a small town called Chelsea, Oklahoma, and they recently moved. There's a, a town 45 minutes to an hour away called Tulsa, which is where we live now. It's where we're at, obviously. Um, but they moved to a suburb of Tulsa, Broken Arrow, um, a couple of years ago, and until about 2016. Uh, Fourth of July was a holiday that my family didn't do anything for. Okay. And I very much spent it with friends and we'd hang out and we, you know, we'd just have fun. Yeah. Uh, friend fun. Friend fun versus family wholesome fun. <laughs> uh, which is great. I love my family. I'm big on family, so I don't, I don't, that's not the case, but, um. It's a little different. Yeah. And so then my mom, when she moved, they got, they have a pool at the house and stuff. And so she wanted to make. They moved after my grandma had passed away, so she kind of became the matriarch of the family right. in that same exchange. And she wanted to have a once-a-year uh, full extended family kind of like semi-reunion on the 4th. Wow. So um, that's what that's what words, words being chosen with Carefully. the care <laughs> of a small child. Yeah, no, it's great, actually. So, like, I, I love my family. I have a lot of awesome cousins, and, like, the weird part is that um, generationally speaking, I'm towards the younger end of the kids, quote, right. unquote, quote unquote kids. Um, the only one younger than me is my brother, Tim. Um, and so 
all of the cousins and brothers above me are somewhere between three and eight years older than me, and most of them have kids. Um, some of their kids are like teenagers now, kind of a thing. Yeah. So uh, there's a ton of kids there, uh, a ton of cousins, ton of basically the whole family is there. So it's uh, I'm also very much girls are fired up, lot grills, of, lot pool, of... a lot of excitement, okay, like so a good time. Yeah, but classic. at the same time, I am very much an introvert, which yes. means I prefer one on one or small groups of people for set amounts of time. So like a six hour period with 70 people that you know, mm -hmm. like well, is like the most terrifying and draining thing imaginable. I, I prefer those one-on-one -on -one sessions with like a big bowl of potato salad, personally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, my, that's my number one. I gotta tell you, man, I, I love potato salad so much. Uh, so in terms of being an introvert, that's yeah, really I'm getting for your birthday. That's really the re relationship I'm looking for. It's like, ah, can I just hang out with this bowl of potato yeah, salad? Yeah, my one-on-one -on -one with the potato <laughs> salad. That's funny. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it comes from this weird obligation of like feeling like I need to spend time and connect with everyone there. Yeah. Um, and that's hard uh, to do. Yeah. So it's I even worse because you got a wedding coming up, and, and I was, you know, you're going to have to do the same that's kind right. of stuff. But I was going into that already tired. Yeah. So like it just. I made it. Here All I am. All right. Well, here yeah. you are. Yeah. You didn't even really get sick or anything, did you? No. Uh, you I had some back. Just took a some, Friday. Back, took Friday. Back. I, yeah, I died. By Friday that week, I was just done. I was out of here. But uh, in more exciting and less family-related news, um, next weekend, so this is going up on a Friday, a week from tomorrow, so a week from Saturday, uh, if you're listening to this on the day it comes out, or watching it on the day it comes out. my Google Calendar? Yeah, I got Steven left. Uh, I don't know, what's the date of it? Anyways, the next Covenant Masters is coming out. Yeah, uh, We had sure the first is. one on June 23rd. The first I think. one was great. The next one was the 21st, maybe? July 21st, I think is correct. Um, I'm super excited about it. We have Way of the Force. It finally came out. Um, so we have a new set. I've drafted it a couple times. It's very different. Yes. To draft that set versus the last set. So we were, and it's worth noting that we're considering going up to Edmund for the store championship this weekend. It's a because, trilogy store championship. Because it's trilogies. And Steven is obsessed with the Gungans. I'm a huge trilogies fan, and I'm a huge fan of making things that are, uh, of course, not supposed to work successful. And if there's ever a concept in the Star Wars universe that is not supposed to work, it's definitely the Gungans. Yeah. So thematically built in. So I'm looking to, uh, we're kind of working on a deck right now, a little Gungan deck, and uh, taking it up there. And in that phase of building this deck, looking through all the new Way of the Force cards, usually the short list of cards is like 45. Because you're ultimately trying to get a deck of 30. And you can trim down to 30. Yeah. Uh, but this one, it was like 50 events. That was, I, th no upgrades. I hadn't even gotten to supports or upgrades because everything is so... I don't want to say, I mean, it's kind of glowing praise, but everything is so tightly balanced around very simple concepts. It's like, here are 20 cards that remove dice, and choose the way that is most beneficial for you to do that. And they all are pretty equivalent. Yeah, so it's I'm like, very do you want to remove your own dice? Set. Do you want to exhaust your characters? Do you want to spend more money? Do you want to... And like, it's not overly complex. It's not like yeah. 20,000 conditions stacked. It's just like, here are tiny little differences in all of these cards, which gives me a sense of, uh, as a deck builder, I think that's so exciting. Because you can't really make a huge mistake, but you can make better decisions sure. in your deck. So well, the was, tweaking process is super fun. You had your list built out, and then you were like, can you just come look at this to like help me call it? Because yeah. like I don't even know where to start at it's this just, point. It was just too much. It's crazy. But yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to experience the trilogy's format. I'm not going to have a ton of time uh, to right. prep before that, which is going to be kind of fun. Because it's just like you just... Everyone's Wild West. West. Everyone's Wild West right now. Uh, but then going into next weekend, that's what like tonight is the day we're recording it is the Destiny Night at Covenant Tulsa. And so I'm planning on drafting once and then getting in as many games as I can outside of that because um, I'm also trying to get ready for the Draft Masters next weekend. That way the Force draft is going to... I love the idea of drafting brand new sets. Yeah. It's totally different dynamic. Well, I've seen, too, like people talking online because th there's a. this is the first set we've had where Rivals was already out. So drafting as a collecting mechanism is the first time this is really viable. That changes everything. Um, and so... Seeing people talk about it online is really cool because people are starting to talk about what cards are good in draft, what cards are bad in draft. And I will say that just in my uh, my opinion, a lot of the, the talk that's going on, I disagree with strongly. Um, certain cards that are like, I don't think this is so good. And it's yeah. like, I love that card. Yeah. I forget the name of it, but there's the, I think it's the Hondo hugging the resource card. <laughs> where you exhaust oh, yeah, the, the character three, three, to put yeah. three money on it. And it's like, what you can do with that in this format is just... There, there's something to be said for... Uh, 
not basically the speed, and this is something with Netrunner compression, right? The idea of it's not all about the total efficiency of the card, because like you could have a really efficient card that pays off over five turns, and that's when it hits like super efficiency, or you could have a less efficient card and it pays off in like one turn or, or one two action, turn. one click. Um, so, so that's a concept that's very familiar to Netrunner players, and that's the kind of card that would challenge traditional thinking and traditional math on a card of whether or not it's worth including. Even if you maybe only net one resource, you net it almost immediately, and that can have a huge impact. And the ultimate quantity leads to bigger totals at a time, which leads to bigger cards playable yeah. out of your hand. Well, that right? was, I think, my first uh, game. I play, I drafted like three or four of them because mm -hmm. no one was picking them. Right, um, right. So first action games to play that, exhaust one of my, I think I exhausted a Prized goods? A Jawa. I think it's prized it, goods. Yeah. But I exhausted Jawa, and then going to turn two, I had the plot where you claim it, if you don't have money, you gain a resource. So I claim, get a money. End of round, I get two more money. First action, get three money. Now I'm at six. Yeah. Planetary Bombardment. Ooh, yeah. And it's like... So I, you're playing the bomb deck, I, then. I had to exhaust a character twice to get But what's a character money. in draft, right? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's just nothing. That's the point, though, is it's like having six, even if I had two three-cost upgrades or two three-cost supports or a four and a two, that... a ability to burst into that is obnoxious super cool so so come to the uh, come to the draft event you can you can find the registration on our website we'll be closing that up actually really soon so please come in uh, we've got all the custom uh, exclusive prizes you can see all of that on the event listing and we'll continue to post about it and promote it on social and elsewhere and I'll also note if you are in the area you know somewhere within three to five hours of I think that's the drivable range in my opinion yeah uh, and you haven't drafted before, or you're relatively new to draft, that's not a big deal. Um, it's a great event for new players. I've seen that the last one, there were a handful of new players, and like the veteran players were all giving all their common, uncommon, and rares to the new players. They were just getting piles of cards nice, yeah. uh, and being helped along and learned a whole bunch. And even the people I uh, was talking with Jim in the store last night, he's recently moved to the area. I think from Manhattan, Kansas. Oh, good places. for him. Yeah, he actually was from Manhattan. Yeah. That's the university up there. That's um, why. But he moved, and uh, I think he ended up going like three and six or something nice. at the event. But he was talking to me last night about how much fun he had. Good. So if you're considering it, Great. do it. Come, hang out. We'll have a good time, and it'll be worth worth your time, I promise. Zach, let's dive into Gen Con, shall we? I mean, this this thing's sneaking up on us. We're uh, like a couple weeks out. I mean, it's not sneaking up. It always sneaks up in a way. I mean, like it's been on the calendar engine. forever, and we've been trying to you know get a hold of it. But Gen Con will be here soon. And that, that always changes the entire landscape and pacing of tabletop gaming for really until December, until the end of holidays. Yeah, it's kind of this weird um, in tabletop if you don't follow it like this. Um, a lot of times May, June, July is kind of a slower season. Um, and then Gen Con hits, and a lot of companies will announce uh, bigger things, new games. That's when Network and X-Wing got announced. That's when Legion got... I mean, you go mm -hmm. back, you go across even non-FFG titles, and like that's usually a lot of announcements happening there. That's also where you have a lot of big tournaments. Yeah. Um, and then that just kind of leads into... The holidays are also a big deal. So a lot of companies will announce big games in August and then put them out sometime leading up to the holidays. Right. Um, and everyone wants to have something coming out in that November, December craze where people are just Absolutely. buying left and right. So uh, it's kind of like the off season right now yeah. in baseball. And then all of a sudden the season's going to be here and it's not going to stop. And it gets insane. Uh, and the things that we're really looking at this year at Gen Con, so we're, I mean, you guys probably know this about us by now. We're not the highest on the totem pole when it comes to board games, right? <laughs> sure. Like, and, and for a lot, of, maybe it has to do with personal preference as well, but... There's just, for the same reason that I don't want to play five sets of Destiny at a time, I don't want to try to keep up with 6,000 new board games every year. I think that's really overwhelming to me, and it's very hard for me to, to keep up, so I, I kind of just, I'm like, uh, well, just forget about it. I think it. the other part about board games, and you either love this or hate this about board games, which is like, I hate rules. <laughs> I hate reading rules. Right? I yeah, hate board games not the best for you. So <laughs> there's a lot of rules in board games, but the reality is like every time you have a board game, every time I've ever played a board game that wasn't like super simple, like uh, what's that mouse game? Um, <laughs> yeah, Swords and Strongholds. Swords and Strongholds. I want to say Mouse, mouse <laughs> which Guard, is really, which is wrong. About as, as minimal of a board game yeah. as imaginable. Or like, you know, Takaido is pretty simple. Element was pretty simple. But it's like if there's a rule book that has to come out for you to teach me. Yeah, like um, the scythes and the bigger yeah, ones. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. And I've played those games before. But like the idea of 
knowing I'm going to learn and buy like 15 or 20 of those this year sounds awful to yeah. me. Like well, I, that's not appealing to me the, as a person. You are kind of, I don't know, I think you're in the minority. It's hard, data in the industry is like all over the place. So it's hard to really yeah. know. But that is one of the benefits. I think that's why we drift to expandable games and why Covenant has built, been a brand built around expandable games is that it creates that kind of lifestyle community feel because you can learn the rules once and then play forever. And I think there's a certain power to having a singular learning moment that then unlocks all future experiences and those experiences change. Yeah, That is really appealing. So rather than every week I have to learn the new data pack rules, it's just the same rule system with well, new it, inputs. Even just keeping up, I mean, at this point, I remember we were at Gamma earlier this year and someone was talking about how many board games are coming out this year. Yeah, And it was, over, uh, it was easily over three or 4,000. And yeah. it's like, so you're saying there's more than 10 games on average coming out a day? Yeah, it's it was like something insane the like The energy that, I would have to spend to keep up with that is, can't. is impossible. Can't. So, like, I just look at it, and it's like, that's why, I mean, obviously board games never clicked for me. That's why you make really good board game friends. Uh, I have that a lot is, of those. That is the killer, killer strategy. Because yeah. they buy them, they try them, and then they teach you, and yeah. you don't ever have to see a rule They book. filter, they curate, and they give you the good experience. And, they, yeah, they teach you right but off the bat. But even then, things. though, like, if they have to more than once or twice pull out a rule book... Mm -hmm. to teach me to play the game, it's like we've probably gone too far. <laughs> yeah, you're a real outlaw. <laughs> I mean, the thing about it, right, is like some of these games, like even something like Netrunner, right, is like yeah. not simple. I mean, it is ultimately a simple system, but like teaching it is, it takes a while to learn that. But I, I think play, players of Netrunner can teach it without referencing a rulebook. And it definitely seems like those systems, there is an easy core basic rule set and then there's a lot of nuance that you have to learn yeah. past that. But even if you don't know the nuance, you can get through the game. Yeah. Whereas with like board games, it's like if I don't understand all of the nuance, I'm doing an entire strategy that will lose me the game in well, two hours. Not, I don't know why we're harping on board games right now. Because <laughs> it's Gen Con. We just, you know what's going to happen? We're going to go to Gen Con, and there's going to be rows upon rows upon rows of new board games, publishers, new board games, new board games. Uh, and even just thinking about that, I think the Gen Con discussion, thinking about that, makes you go to that space of like there's a lot of board games out there and yeah. a lot of the vi like the energy and excitement of a big convention like Gen Con is from all of the new board games that are coming out and going and trying them all demoing them playing them picking up a few limited edition copies you know like hustling through the hall which is an amazing hobby i mean i think it's super cool i just don't know how people do it you guys are very impressive <laughs> props to board all gamers out there huge amount yeah that's of, why like i think props. about it and like I will cruise Gen Con, and like we found Element last year, mm -hmm. and there will be certain games that are just obviously correct, right? Yeah. That I'm uh, that appeal to me obviously. Yeah. Uh, and outside that, it's just like, like I, I get it. I was there. We were in early on the press hour when it was like photosynthesis, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to think of the two or three other Terraforming big ones. Mars. Terraforming Mars forget. was a big one. <laughs> um, there was that um, Scythe was big. At what's the time. that? Uh, Plaid Hat. Uh, the story Legacy book game? tales. Oh, uh, the uh, the ship one. Uh, Rob Devoe did it. Yeah. The, uh, Seafall. Seafall. I mean, we, it's like, but yeah. like, goodness gracious. <laughs> and actually, you know what? Charterstone almost got me. Uh, it should. I, it's incredible. The, the thing about that that almost got me is it's a legacy game, but but when you're done with it, you've built the board. And that's yeah. how the board is for the rest of time when you play it, yeah. which is cool and it looks good. It's my style of like yeah. visuals, uh, but it did not. A lot it, of innovation it didn't get me. Anyway, so Gen Con, what what are you looking at? At Gen so Con? this is the kind of the point is like there's only a few things because I'm looking at that we and, know of. and we as Covenant are looking at really what are the expandable games, potentially new communities that could be formed, new I, avenues by which people can get involved. That's something important to mention too because there isn't a board game. There is a board game community, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, growing up, right, we started with these expandable games. And I think the communities that develop around these games that stick around mm -hmm. um, are just, they form slight, somewhat different relationships. And it's starting to happen now with board games because they're coming out frequently enough where you can actually like board game with people for a long time. Yeah. Um, but that's another big upside to me about the expandable games. It's like, I'm going to go to Edmond on Saturday and I'm going to see 15 people that I've known playing Destiny for two years and probably some other game before that for five years before yeah. that. And that's just a different kind of community than like, you know, if you're going to play Seafall, you're probably playing it with your three or four buddies. Yeah. Uh, you know, people you know already. Um, just a different experience. And that's one of the, I kind of, to, I guess, put an end on this. I've been, I've been thinking so much about why the expandable model, just like, and when I say that, you know, I think it's assumed what we mean, right? The LCGs, the CCGs, um, the miniatures games that have the pretty good pace of releases. 
there's something about I can go to a Destiny event and everybody knows the rules together and I can walk in and play, boom, I'm right there. And that is a much easier way to introduce oneself to a large group of people as a shared space with a shared rule set that everybody agrees on and there's no confusion. Um, when I go to like a board game meetup, I don't know if it's going to be playing something that I've already played, that I want to play, that everybody else knows how to play, that I don't know how to play, those sure. kinds of things. So you can break the ice on that by being smart about how you basically frame your board game meetups, but a lot of times it's, here's board game day, show up and like bring your favorites and try to play some other ones. And there's a lot of figuring out what to play that goes on, whereas with Destiny it's we're here to play yeah. this one's particular sure. thing. Um, but on that note, so I mean, some big movement, which is crazy in in the space. Ultimately, that there's such really big things happening that nobody talks about before they happen. Sure, and we're just like, where's the promote? Where's the like six month build up, like a movie release or something like that? It's crazy to me. Transformers, the collectible card game, from lots of trading yeah, card Wizards. game from Wizards of the Coast. It's not even on their website. Yeah, it's like you, there's some article the other day from somewhere else talking about it and showing the booster T-formers. packs and stuff. T-formers. T-formers. Is that or T-formers.net. Or is that a new site? That's a, that's a fan site for all things Transformers. They got the scoop on that's some of the new Transformers cards. It's Wildcats, But it's man. like this is a, a huge IP that's going to hit kind of the sweet spot of the demographic that grew up with this property in their lives as a significant part of their like nostalgia. Like Transformers, to me, is... So awesome. Yeah. Near and dear. Had toys, had everything. Well, and like, it's not only hitting, but it's hitting at a time where they're adults. Mm -hmm. And it's, from the article, it looks like, they're, you know, it says eight and up. And it's like, kind of reminds me of Destiny in the way that it's supposed to be very simple. Yeah. Um, but the people talking about having played it already say that there's a certain amount of depth to it that's good. Um, so that makes a lot of sense, right? Like, I've seen a number of people playing Destiny with their kids or X-Wing with their kids. So it's mm -hmm. the same kind of thing where it's, you're in your 30s or 40s, and you have a kid that's somewhere between 8 and 20, and you want to share Transformers with them. Perfect. It's like, this is a big thing. Uh, but the weird part is just like, who's talking about it? Where is it? Where is it? So, like, I did a Google search, um, you know, starting a couple of months ago, trying to find, you know, information. How do I play it? Like, There's like one article the cards like? ICBT Where's the website? Right? Can I sign up for a newsletter? It's non-existent, which is crazy. So, I guess they're just kind of... There's this habit to keep things under wraps and then like blow it out at Gen Con and try to be the star and of the show. I don't even know if Transformers is going to be at Gen Con. Yeah, that's true. Wiz Wiz know. Wizards is Gen Con's an interesting Gen Con is, and Wizards is strange in their relationship with Gen Con because like even their magic footprint has shrunk at Gen Con over the it years. It used to be much bigger when we were younger, but I think part of that I, I don't know if it's related or not, but I know the founder of Wizards, Peter Atkinson, is now owner of Gen Con. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that plays out or why, um, but it's at least an interesting thing. It, it might just not be a good spin for them, honestly. Yeah. They might not need it or want it. Yeah. Um, so well, that's like, their... More and more, Gen Con is not becoming a great place to host big events. Yeah. Like, the convention hall's huge. There's tons of people. And, like, hosting a tournament that you have to pay that much money to get to... Um, Maybe not the best it's choice. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. And spending a day or two of Gen Con at a tournament is just becoming... We, we, like, we went we, that first we time. We said it before. It's like, I just don't think that's the role of Gen Con in your, in your tournament circuit. Yeah. Um, but so Transformers uh, is super interesting to me. I mean, we're going to try to get a hold of it, demos, etc. Try to bring that out to the world. Uh, also, Warhammer, the I think it's called Champions. Uh, War, I'm sorry. Warhammer Age of Sigmar, you know, TM. Uh, Champions. Champions. <laughs> It's uh, by Play Fusion, and they're also going to be, uh, I'm sure, showing Lightseekers there, which is a game that we want to take a look at as well. So Lightseekers and Warhammer Champions. Another, like, anytime something happens with that Warhammer license, uh, especially when it's a collectible game of some kind, an expandable game of some kind, you need to be paying attention, right? And so this looks super cool, too. And again, I don't know how it's played. I don't know... You, sure. The website is pretty good. The Play Fusion website is pretty good. Still don't know how to play it, though. I looked on YouTube last week. I couldn't find any demos, how to play, what, what is it like, like how does it work. Um, so looking for that uh, at the con as well. And then, of course, God's here. Like, going to connect with Steam Forged, get an update on that. I think we might be in a place where we can get an actual here's the finished rules, maybe, on camera. That's cool. Um, so we'll try to do that if it's ready. I don't know if it'll be ready by then. And then, uh, among others, we definitely want to catch up with our friends at Arena Rex. 
Sure. Continue Always love that game. Slow burn of success, yeah. I think, from the Arena X team. My models I'm slowly working on. And then anything else. I mean, that's uh, the cool thing about Gen Con, more yeah, opportunities. Any kind of expandable thing. Also, of course, um, the Fantasy Flight in-flight is always a big yeah. deal, and that's moved to the Wednesday night before So Gen much Con. smarter. It's crazy. Um, last year, we were able to stream that, um, and we're going to hopefully try that again. Uh, but it'll we be the night phones, before. Right? Yeah. Uh, so it'll be the night before. I'm curious to see what they do there. Um, always looking for Destiny news. We have second edition X-Wing coming out not that far after. What's going on with X-Wing? Um, and it's Wednesday night, so I think this is a really good switch for them. Where they, bef- at the beginning of the con, they make the announcement, start selling, start building hype, rather than hyping. in the middle of yeah. the con. Because they used to do it better. Friday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And so like they, had, like I was there when they announced any number of these games, but like I remember Imperial Assault. It's yep. so, like they announced it on Friday afternoon, and then you're halfway through the show. Yeah, is when you start demoing Imperial Assault. So half of the time, people could have been demoing the new game. They, they That's weren't. Right. That's right. So it's a it's a much better plan ultimately, I think. And uh, looking at the Asmodee digital presentation, our friends over at Shut Up and Sit Down are giving that presentation, which is really fascinating. Or like hosting it, right? Yeah, they're like hosting it, um, which is cool. And that's honestly that's a pretty good strategy to outsource because the reality is like you as a publisher may not be the most charismatic team, sure. right? So if you want somebody to be charismatic and hyper game up, go out to the charismatic content people, which SUSD is at the top of that list, and see if they'll do it. I imagine they're getting some kind of you know payment for it. Like, hey, will you come host our thing? We'll we'll pay you yeah. this amount of cash. Well, and even just the reality of like, if it's you talking about your thing, it's different than another party talking about your Certainly. thing as well. Like, there's just vibe, a different yeah. vibe to it. And uh, there is going to be the Lord of the Rings digital version, which we're going to get our, our hands on, going to get some demos of that, I hope, and really see. I don't I don't know where I fit personally into digital games, and certainly where Covenant fits into digital games, but I don't want to miss anything. It's interesting. So we, we got to keep our yeah. eyes open. Now, more interesting Always. than anything is they, I don't know if we talked about it on the cast or not, but they announced their, like, limited edition new starter for Lord of the Rings that's like a mm-hmm. two-player physical that starter. That's beautiful. It's just got a weird target. With early digital access and playmats and stuff. But more important to me, the starter I wish they would do in every game they ever do, which is it's a, a two-player starter that comes with inside the starter is two pre-built decks instead of a smattering of random cards to build a deck. Perfect. Um, and I think they're learning. You see something like Arkham where they've integrated the deck building process into the game. Yeah. Um, because I think the time from opening the box to actually playing the game needs to be as short as humanly possible. Yeah, that's a really good uh, metric. Especially coming from the person who doesn't like to read the rules. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, <laughs> you, There's plenty of those people out there, too. And in fact, I would say a vast number of those people live well outside of the sphere that currently encompasses tabletop games. So if you're looking to expand the audience, diversify the audience, you need to have games that are way more accessible than the current. Which offerings. I think if you're doing a Lord of the Rings game, that can be super accessible to so many people in the world. And then not only that, but you're doing a digital version. So yeah. like that is everybody in the world, not everybody in the world. I'll, I'll scale that back. Everybody, most people at this point, uh, especially in the United States, carries a phone around their pocket. Right. So the accessibility of like a digital Lord of the Rings card game is high. Absolutely. Um, so having, if you do, I don't know what the goal is, right? But if the goal is, uh, if you ultimately want some number of them to transition into physical as well, um, having very accessible starters is key. It's very key. And I hope, and we see this in the Throne starter decks as well. This sure. seems to be the trend. So, yes, keep it keep, up. Keep doing please. that. What about uh, Meta Arcade? That's someone that I feel like you keep bringing we, back into the we, sphere. So we just stumbled upon Meta Arcade, and we're like, this is not at all relevant to our business. <laughs> um, probably never will be. But it's such a cool uh, way to do something and seems like such a competent team that it's like, well, let's just take a look at it because it's interesting. So their entire thing, it's about a platform that is kind of being able to solo through a lot of the standard kind of RPG adventure style um, campaigns that became popular, I think, like probably late 70s, early 80s in that kind of period where you had the Choose Your Own Adventure books that were colliding with the I can build a character while I'm choosing my own adventure, get new gear, get inventory. And so you were essentially, you know, taken away from needing a five, four, three person group and you could have an adventure by yourself. Hmm. Um, and so they did, they took some of those old concepts and created a digital platform, an app that allows you to, on your phone, play through those kinds of adventures. Hmm. And they started with Tunnels and Trolls 
And now we've gotten to, they've teamed up with Chaosium, which are the people that did the Cthulhu Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. And they are putting out, I think, launching with six standalone adventures in the Cthulhu mythos. And on the app. On the app. So you choose your investigator, and there's a number of you know standard tropes to choose from. <laughs> sure. And then you build this character as you move through these Cthulian events, and sometimes you end up going crazy and you got to start over. That's awesome. Uh, and there's various uh, trees and whatnot. And the coolest thing about this whole thing is that they have an adventure creator, where the community can create their own adventures, publish them to That's the really app. Cool. And then they get a percentage of the sales on that adventure. That's so really cool. Yeah, so really, if, you, if you build really cool stories that get popular, then you could potentially like correct, make money off of that. Yeah, I mean, if it gets big enough, and if the audience is there, that could be somebody's full time job. It's like you know, YouTube creators somehow getting billions of views for doing nothing, and uh, five making reasons billions of dollars, you should right? go to the bathroom. <laughs> Thanks, YouTube. Uh, that's cool. I'm excited to see what that's all about. Yeah. We'll yeah. take a look at it, man. Um, also, one thing I want to note, uh, I want to give you a chance, because I heard you and Robert talking about this yesterday, which is <laughs> there was a new Legion announcement. It's I, I have a few things to say. First off, hold on, before you get to that point. It's such a stupid thing for me to even like be upset about. It has no, there's it's no reason even, to be upset. I don't know that you're upset. It's I'm not just, upset. It's just, but just it's, uh, amusing to you. So, yeah. first thing to me is, I think what they're doing with Legion right now is pretty cool, um, which is Star Wars Miniatures game, super accessible, super easy to learn, super easy to put together. Well, John almost died off camera. Uh, but super easy to learn. It's, it's a little, you know when the chair locks and then the lock breaks and you like fall backwards? That's what just happened off screen, uh, which is great. We've all been, I mean, if you've ever been in an office chair, you've had that moment. Um, it's as if the world ceases to exist yeah. for half a second. Yeah, you're, you're plunging into <laughs> eternity. That's so good. Uh, anyways, so what they're kind of doing with the release schedule is what I like. Um, and... It's the inverse of what they're doing with L5R, which I'm not a huge fan of. Okay. Um, but basically, with Legion, uh, and to compare it to like Imperial Assault. So Imperial Assault came out, and then the first wave was basically a deluxe box with like expansions for units next to it, right? Yeah. And so that would come out once every six months ish. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, you know, you'd have five or six months where nothing new came out. So you plow through the campaign in a month, and then you wait. You wait. Or the, the skirmish meta is the same for a while, anyway. So Legion. Uh, it came out in March, I believe it was March, um, and they basically were like, hey, here's announcements of future things that are coming out. And then every month or so, what's happening is they're putting out a commander with a new unit. So, like, we got Veers and Snowtroopers, okay. um, or we got Leia and the Rebel Commando looking dudes. Always faction specific, so, like, one, like, heroes. So far, it's been then, Rebel, yeah. then Imperial, Rebel, then Imperial. Um, but, like, th they just announced Palpatine and the Royal Guards. Um, and... But what they're doing is that they're every month or so they're announcing a new thing, and they're also releasing a new thing. Oh, good. Okay. Which is different. A system. A system where it's like, like here's a, here's new stuff that changes the game. Cool. Play with it. A couple weeks later, here's new things that are coming in the future. Cool. A couple weeks later, here's actual new stuff that affects the game. And like, there's this like pace that's going on. Okay. Instead of it being like, because like when they first announced it, it was like they announced Leia and Veers and the Commandos and uh, the Snowtroopers. Uh, and it was like, okay, that's going to be one big wave, right? And then they announced Boba Fett at some point, and now Palpatine and stuff. So, like, instead of doing this big wave, they're actually doing more consistent, more of a steady drum beat, um, which I like a lot. Wow. Like, I think I actually that's, think that's, that's pretty cool, pretty important yeah. to keeping a, an expandable game, the momentum going behind it. Do you ever feel like at A and A that they have, or FFG? I don't know who makes those decisions, but that they have like six different experiments running. And that eventually it will be refined enough and optimized enough that the system can be applied to like things in that family of games. Like I have to imagine this whole Alpha Var thing is a, is an attempt to to experiment right with a model that needs some experimenting, and then maybe it's like oh this worked really well so our next LCG if there is one. Uh, you know, apply it to that. Yeah. And then get that system I, running. I mean, I, I assume there are experiments happening. Where even with L5R, like, I think the six pack six weeks was a natural response to, um, we've all played LCGs, um, or at least we have. I don't know if the people listening have. And there are definitely these weird phases where it's like, at some point early on, it's not fast enough. Like, you get bored at some point because there's not enough content. Yeah, corset, um, et cetera. But then later on, it's also like, it's, 
there's a nice middle ground that like a year after a year or so for the next year and a half, it's nice. It's like every pack's still really relevant, but at the same time, it's not too fast. Yeah. Um, but then there also comes a point where a new pack just is meaningless. Or it's Card like, pool's too big. There's not enough going on. So yeah. I think a lot of what they're trying to do is solving those problems. Um, but I, the uh, the thing for me about any game, I, I don't I don't even think it matters on the format as much as it's just like an expandable game where you need a community of people playing for it to be successful. You can't just have large periods where nothing's happening, unless when things are happening, it's so much that it takes a long time to digest. Which I think they're trying to do a six pack six weeks, but with L five R as an example versus um, something like Destiny, L five R is divided into like all the clans, right? So all the clans and the, one of the more contentious things, all of these seeker roles, keeper roles, sure. air, you Down know, the line. so like there's a lot of unusable and cards. Divided which, into two decks. Yeah. When you're playing, right? So that's really tough. That's where like even six packs coming out for L five R is just if I'm a Phoenix player, I might be looking at like six to ten new cards. Mm-hmm. And then six I, I might get more cards in six months. Yeah. So, anyways, a lot of experiments uh, with Legion. I, I like to see the consistency. I would have loved to have had that with Imperial Assault. Like, I can imagine if like this month Luke comes out, next month Palpatine comes out, next mm-hmm. month R two and C three P. Did you do the out. same thing for X one? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I would much rather have a consistently rolling meta that's just evolving, where like you know you rotate the factions. So however fast you're going to put ships out. Because um, I think it keeps things moving, and especially with the, like, you can buy all the things in your faction and not need to buy the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Um, it's like, even though Imperials might not get anything, at least the Rebel game has changed. And so when I show up, there's a new challenge that I have to face kind of a thing. Um, so I I, have, I don't know why you wouldn't. Like, cool. t- to me, I, I would look at how many am I putting out this year and then divide that evenly across the entire year and uh, go from there. Well, speaking of X-Wing, tell me this, Coruscant bum, bum, bum. Invitational. I'll tell you this what. It's a big deal, right? So I'm tell sad me I don't this. have an invite to this. I don't um, know anything about it, really. Is this, the big, is this a big X-Wing event? It is a big X-Wing event. The one that you snuck into last year? Uh, yes and no. They did it differently. It is that one. It is the one I snuck into. Uh, but So the one at Celebration last year was at Celebration, first off. And you had to win a Invitational or an Open Series event to go. Right. Was, and there were eight of them, so you just made it into the top eight, right? Um, this year, it was like the top eight at every Invitational. Okay. Um, and then certain, like top four, top eight at certain events, like Gen Con or whatever. Um, but you get an invite to an event. This is at FFG's headquarters in Roseville, okay. Minnesota. And it's basically, I think there's going to be somewhere between 100 and 200 players. Do they pay your way to get there? I don't think so. They paid your way to get to Celebration, didn't they? Did they yes. get you in? Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe the winners. I think the winners get paid. Okay, cool. Uh, but the top, you know, top eight, it's like the other seven. They're invited. They're invited. Um, and it's this big event. There's going to be all these promos and all that fun stuff, but it's you got to earn your way in, right? And uh, it'll be second edition because it's happening in October. So sub- second edition comes out in uh, September. I assume they'll have some cool new stuff to show off when everyone's there. Um, but it's kind of just a big X-Wing World Championship style weekend, but it's only X-Wing, yeah. and there's a new version of the game out, and it's only people who That'd be have qualified. Uh, which I love, right? Like, one of the complaints about Worlds is that registration historically has been sign up and hope you get it. Right. It's random. Um, whereas, like, you know, if you have to earn your way in, I can't complain that I didn't get a ticket. Right. It's like, go to more events, go to more whatever, regionals, open series. It's a cool way to encourage participation in that stuff. Um, and, you know, if, if it's like, if the top four at every regional qualified, I'm sure more people would go to more regionals. Yeah, that's to try true. To, to claim that spot, right? What are your predictions? What's going to happen? Um, Paul Heaver's going to win. <laughs> yeah, <it's just laughs> easy, uh, easy no, prediction. I mean, I, I'm interested to see how it goes. I, I know they've they've already said that next year X Wing's in its own World Championship weekend. They said Legion's get in its own Championship weekend. I assume Destiny will get its own weekend. Wow. So I have a feeling, like even with Destiny, we have the like galactic qualifiers that are happening, and um, a lot of times those are happening next to the Open Series for X Wing. And so I kind of like this idea of turning your world championship into a big weekend for your one game. Um, it lets them host more people at their event center, right? Yeah. It also makes it focused on one thing. So if they're going to do a hyperspace report, uh, it can be about that one game. There you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and they can just, you know, this is your touch point every year. Here's how the game's doing. Here's where we're at. Here's our plans. Here's our excitement. Here's the designer. All that kind of stuff. Um, and the more they make it mostly qualified based, 
I think the better it will be because that inherently encourages the rest of the system to work. Yeah. Which is go to your regionals, go to your galactic qualifiers, support your you know regional and local events. Um, so we'll see. I'm, I'm I mean, excited to see how it turns and out. And it's going to be good for that event center too because on A, you don't have it just slammed where it's an unsustainable amount of people. And B, you get like eight weekends of good sales in store. So you have eight out of what, 52 that are already taken care of weekend wise. So it seems like a win win for sure for sure. A, a place like that. Um, great. Well, hey, before we uh, stop with the news, I. I don't know, but something is lingering with Game of Thrones for me. Um, <laughs> and I, I think it's just having the those starter decks coming up pretty quick that, you know, I have a, I have a side interest. Well, I also feel like I had the same pool. Is the card pool the same? Is it bigger, rather? Is the card pool, like, to a point where we're, like, feeling excited again? What's, the, what's going on here? Well, it's... So is the design better? Maybe. I hope. I think it is. Uh, but we played Thrones for several years. And the local community, the, the uh, diehards, have stayed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I see them a lot I'll, week to week. You just see them playing and stuff. I was watching the other day. It looked great. And then the thing about it is that you start, you know, you see it, and then eventually it starts looking like something interesting. Yeah. And I think it's gotten to that point where it's interesting again. The thing that really got me looking again were the big dragons. Yeah. So once those hit, I started looking. And I was like, oh, this is seems like a better version of the old game at this point. But you know what? Case in point is... The idea of buying everything that I would need to build a deck that I would want to Not play for Greyjoy, man. I can't do it. But if you can buy a fifteen dollar deck, I'll play it. Yeah, especially if it's Drowned God, I'll play. That's it what's forever. crazy to me is like I will, I'm willing to at least buy the deck and play in one event to see if the deck's worth playing. That's right. Yeah, and go from there for sure. Well, let me let me. So something that I've noticed and keeping an eye on the Thrones previews. They're doing a great job of making so much death happen in this game. It is a death league game. There's even the new, there's the the plot, the tin costs and whatnot, and everything else gets blown up. Uh, but look at it. So look at this. You'll you'll like this. I pulled <laughs> these so I could read them. Look at it. Uh, we have three examples of this. Uh, one of them I'm particularly interested in. But we got the shadows mechanic coming. I was back. gonna say this is from the Daggers in the Dark preview. Yes. Um, and recently, the Shadows mechanic has made its way back in the game. Right, which at the time, like, wasn't necessarily one of my favorite things, but I'm coming around to it. I, I, I think day. it does fit. So you put this thing in the Shadows. Anyway, Varys comes out, Shadow cost of 8, has Stealth. His it's Shadow big, cost is 8? It's a big dad. Reduce the cost to bring him out of Shadows by 1 for each other card in Shadows. Yours or your opponent's. Mm, so it's Varys. It's Shadow this King. is classic Varys. Reaction, after he comes out of Shadows, choose and kill a character with power. Tell me that's not Varus. Tell me that's that is not great. perfectly yeah. flavorful. He just sneaks through the tunnels. Uh, <laughs> he does. He sneaks through those tunnels, and then he murders you. <laughs> he sneaks right through those tunnels. <laughs> then we have uh, an event, Shadows Event, Daggers in the Dark, for the old Night's Watch That's there. the name of the pack. Shadow 2. Spoiler. Wait a second. <laughs> Reaction. After you win a challenge, the defending player choose and kill an attacking character. So that gives you a lot of like, uh, I don't know if I want to mm. like. So if you're playing against Night's Watch and they put something in the shadows. Yes. Now anytime you attack, you realize that if they can defend it, they might be able to kill you. And the coolest part of this card, the attacking player may sacrifice two characters to cancel this effect. Oh, that's so really cool. cool. Two, so cool. Two for, two for one business. So cool. Um, and then the third, and of course my favorite because he's Greyjoy, uh, Makoro, who was a big mm. dad in first edition. Uh, shadow cost of five. After he comes out of shadows during a challenge, choose a defending character, put it on top of its owner's deck. <sighs> That's disgusting. It's so good. But it's his shadow so cost of five, right? Yeah. So like if your opponent's sitting at five gold and Greyjoy has a character in shadows. Yeah. Watch it could out. be. It yeah. could be the Makora. But it could also just be nothing. And then he comes out, he's three strength with a power icon, so he's not like blowing it up. And he's Raholer. I wish that he was uh, Drown God. Of course he's not. In the lore, like, etc. But putting the character nice. on top of the deck is crazy. Oh, time. it's so good during a challenge, right? Yeah, it's a defending character, so it's like man. so you remove the character, and like if it's like a six gold character, they're just gone. If they have power on them, they're gone. Bomb like, card, it's just crazy. Bomb card. So yeah, so in, case in point, three cards in that pack, obliterating characters, and I think that's a good way to keep that game in check because when it's fifteen character board versus fifteen character board, it's awful. No one got time for that. Nobody wants that. No one's got time for Nobody that. Nobody wants it. All right. Uh, well, I'm excited. I'm excited to try Thrones again. 
Me too. And I will. I will Let's be see if those starter again. decks yeah. are worth anything. Um, you ready to dive into some questions before we get out of here? Yeah, we got some Aristea boxes uh, showing off of here. Yeah, the we video did just went up. We did just put a video up. That's been a long time in the making. That's from Adepticon. We've just had other priorities, uh, but it's really quite cool. I mean, the game itself is cool. This whole sports ball thing, <laughs> sports ball, uh, like sport games, seem to really be uh, kicking around. A guild ball, of course, is in there. RSA introducing kind of a gladiator style take I, into the genre. I've always felt like, this is way off topic, I've always felt like I'm a sports fan. Yeah. Um, I've always felt like a drafting game uh, based on football or basketball would make a lot of sense. Okay. You like draft your team, right? Yeah. And then you play. Um, Are there salary caps? Maybe. That's probably your, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, there should be. I think it's part of the draft, there right? There should like, be, right? You have a limited amount of resources. Yep. You have to buy, yeah. and then as players aren't taken, you stack things on them. We've all seen Euro games before. This yeah. is not hard to figure this out. This is not. But anyways, uh, it is. It, this is like sci-fi sports, right? Yeah. And, yeah, it's cool. And like there's fantasy, a, like Guild Ball. It reminds me so much. If you remember the old American Gladiators where there's like hoops. Do I remember the there's, American Gladiators? You know where they the like hit game, each other the with the stuff? game where you, you got your helmet on and then you grab the little ball and then you try to slam it oh, into the middle totally, basket yeah. or the side basket. what that and, feels like? And you just get wrecked the whole time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean it kind of we feels like We used to like play that at my grandma's house. Did you? Yeah. Did you know you were playing? Yeah, you'd suit up and they'd have pillows and like you're hitting. <laughs> it, was, it, was, awesome. it was a real thing. We loved Gladiator. Uh, childhood, man. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun. Alright, so first question here for the week. If you're unfamiliar with the show, you can use the hashtag Ask Covenant on Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and we answer your questions right here on the show. We love doing it, so please we leave your questions. It. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, always mind-boggling to me that there are enough people asking questions for us to keep doing this week in, week out. Uh, so I appreciate that. First question comes from Ben Davies. He says, I know I'm a bit late to the party, but I'm finally watching the Learning Netrunner series. I'm loving the video so much I decided to buy it into the game despite it having been terminated recently. I don't suppose you'll be doing a last hurrah release of token sets for the game by any chance. I'm super keen to get my hands on some cards and have a few games with my partner, but as Steven said, cardboard tokens don't seem terribly futuristic. There's no cardboard in the future. Anyway, guys, thanks heaps for all the amazing content. I look forward to seeing what you have to show us next. Thanks, Ben. That's You're very awesome. welcome. Thank That's you for really the kind nice. words. Uh, I mean, so the thing about the, the data tokens, I mean, they're, they're certainly on a clock. I'll say that. They're certainly on a clock. Um, when that clock is up is yet to be really determined slash decided. So we're currently still making them. Yeah. And you, if they're out of stock when you see them, you can get on the wait list. Join that wait list. That is incredible way to like. You get an email immediately when they come back in. And now the thing about happen. this, right, is that with the game going away, um, it could have gone a lot of ways. But like with the packs, the demand spiked through the roof, and there's a lot of yeah. people who want to make sure they get this stuff before it goes away. So if you see them in stock, grab them. Uh, if they're not in stock, get on the wait list, and then you'll get notified when they come back in stock. Um, but there's definitely a, a time limit on how long we're going to keep making these. Yeah. So hopefully everyone that wants them will end up with them. But uh, you know, jump when you we'll have. We'll try to make it the right time, but it's hard. It's yeah. I mean, it's, at some point we have to make the call to stop producing them. Yeah. Because we also don't want to just be sitting in a bunch of these at the end of this that are. Ultimately, never going to sell. Nobody wants. That's a waste of time and money. Shall I go on, Matthias Papasil? With the end of Netrunner, it's a shame. It is. Do you reckon FFG will announce a new LCG? Maybe even this year. Cheers, ask Covenant. Zach, let me feel this one. I just don't think so. I don't think so. I think if you look at the 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 trending on this, I think they've got their hands full with L5R. And in fact, I get the sense that they're trying to figure out what to do with L5R. And I think there's been some existential questions about, especially competitively, the LCG model. Now, I think Lord of the Rings and Arkham are just great, fine, as they are. But we see Netrunner now has dropped out. Um, the Star Wars LCG earlier dropped out. We've got L5R Conquest that's there. Conquest went away. We've got Conquest that dropped out. L5R being figured out, trying to be expanded. There's always well, you know, difficulties going on. I don't know. They would certainly need to define the LCG a little bit better for me. Yeah, and maybe they will with the next release. But I, be cool. I think that's LCG model for me is very suited for cooperative games yeah. for all the reasons. The slow burn is fine because a cooperative game you don't need to play all the time and like min max out. Um, and it's just kind of an ideal scenario for that. So I think what needs to be solved is not the LCG model, is whether or not competitive games can exist in it. Right. And if so, how? Right. So and it probably changes, and that's what we've seen with L five R. Right? They change the release because it doesn't make sense to have that kind of thing that works for cooperative games just applied 
too and, competitive. And the other thing I'll mention, just from a speculative uh, standpoint, we speculated a couple episodes back on when we were first dealing with the end of Netrunner. Um, it seems like this wasn't exactly a thing that was known about well in advance. Right, the um, Netrunner at the end of... Reprinting the core sets, doing a revised yeah. core set in general and stuff. So, um, and I just know the effort that goes into designing a game and then yeah. the time it takes to print a game and to prepare the marketing and announcements and get all that ready. Um, I would be shocked to see something at Gen Con unless they already had it in the pipeline. Like a super surprise kind of thing? Yeah. That would be a super surprise. But like, you know, I mean, they have like two cooperative games right now. They've got Thrones and L5R. Um, am I missing any? I don't want to leave any out here on the LCG. Uh, there probably are. Technically, Ashley's kind of counts yeah, um, at this kinda. point. Um, kind of. Kinda counts. I think. I guess. A, I guess that's true. At this point, I mean, I always considered in my head there being a lot more, but we we've seen a lot of them kind of fall down. Yeah, because Conquest, Star Wars, Netrunner are now all gone. Huh. Um, so interesting. Isn't but it? you know, I I don't know. Like you're saying, it's like it, it seems like with Alpha, they're still trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. So I'd be surprised if they're aiming to launch more into that. Um, unless it's a cooperative. I could easily see another cooperative. Man, game there's hitting. so many opportunities. Um, it could be an Android-based cooperative sure. game, but given the the short info, like cycle for Netrunner ending, we presume they wouldn't have had time to get an Android game worked up yeah. and launched by... There's no way. I don't yeah. think there's any way. I'd I, say no. I, I don't think this year. We'll I'd see. be hugely surprised. All right. Question number three. Kaya Margulis, Star Wars Episode One Racer is the only reason I keep an S64 That's exactly two. right. That is correct. That's exactly right. One of my favorite games of all time, and it was quite a treat to have two less frequent videos in the cast together. Voices uh, in the cast, rather. Oh, sorry. Ben also, and... Uh, who was that? Ben and you? Ben and me. I think so. Also, Philip K. Dick is amazing, so glad to hear. Oh, no, He's was that Jonathan red, or Robert? Red. It wasn't me. It was Jonathan and Robert. I think it was Jonathan and Robert. Uh, as Did far as that... about Racer? Pod Racer? Was that the, the mm-hmm. episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, as for my team covenant, or ask covenant this week, my friend and I have been debating the fundamental difference between last stand games, like miniature games and chess, where pieces only leave the board, and snowballing or growth games, so like cool. card games, where you start with nothing and build up a force. Which of these do you prefer, and which do you find more skillful and satisfying? Do the games you currently play reflect uh, tend to reflect on which games you like more, and has this tendency changed over the years? This is like an incredible question. Absolutely incredible. So the two games I play the most at this point are Destiny and X-Wing, and it's both of these kinds of games, right? So X-Wing is that you start with everything on the board, and you remove pieces. Yeah. Destiny is you start with characters on the board, and you remove those pieces, but you're also building. It's, like it's kind of in kind the of middle. Thing. Yeah. Um, so, and then there are certain games where you start with nothing. Yeah. Right. Um, that's how magic is. That's how spoils was. Even, even technically, like Thrones is is kind of like that. You have a setup, but You're really that setup is part yeah. of the growth and, yeah. and building phase. I love. First of all, I love the distinction. That's a cool distinction to make. I had never really even considered I hadn't that. Considered games like that, and I love it. Um, when I think of games like, uh, of course, chess, swords and strongholds, um, these are games that I love, and maybe it's because you start. You both start with the same exact resource count and then it's about the way that you decide you know make your decisions that very directly influences when and how those pieces leave, like leave the board i think one of the cool things about like the growth style games they they probably tend to be more uh, spontaneous and more about adapting to uh, things that are uh, you know random so you know generally to have that kind of a growth uh, build the board kind of game, you have to have a lot of random variables that you're choosing to either play or not play. And of course that introduces an element of randomness, whereas with chess, you don't have to have any random variables aside from the choice that you make. Sure. Uh, so certainly I think that those games are more likely to be cerebral and very much about bettering yourself and being better than the player across from you because there's really no question marks about it. Uh, and with X-Wing, like, if you didn't have for instance, if everything had a static stat that you were comparing, you could play a game of X-Wing with no randomness whatsoever and probably get similar outcomes where the better better flying, the decisions you make as far as maneuvering and who you shoot would determine your victory. So I think that does lend it to be way more um, zoomed in, right? Like, uh, uh, whereas the other ones may be a little more fun, spontaneous. Um, uh, the randomness of life is one of the most interesting things about it, right? <laughs> sure. So there's something about those kinds of games that is very exciting because you never quite know what's going to happen. Well, and I think that's what, you know, I like both styles of games. And the one thing I wanted to point out was like, you know, because there's like chess where you have pieces and you remove them. 
And one of the cool things about something like X-Wing is that there's still the randomness of what your opponent chose to bring and how that matches up to what you chose to bring. So it's still stylistically like chess in that you start with pieces and remove them um, versus building with like a card game or something. So like I don't, I don't know if either of those are more enjoyable to me, like mm-hmm. building and then optimizing right or like just using the pieces I brought to the table. Um, but I definitely know that the randomization of your opponent is appealing to me. Yeah. Whereas like, I'm not an play. I like chess. It's fine. I have fun playing it, right? <laughs> but it's like, if someone's better than me, I lose. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. And there's nothing I can really do about that. Yeah. Uh, and so like, and it's the same every time. Now, Bobby Fischer random, I'm more into. Yeah. Right? Well, Fischer I'm, in, random. I'm into that. Give it to me. So I don't I don't know. I don't know what my proper answer to that is. Actually, I think I'm more inclined towards remove things from the board style games. Um, but I also like the randomness. I mean, but think it about can't be too random. You have to build a Netrunner. Yeah, that's true. But also, okay, but here's the thing about Netrunner, though. <laughs> if, if you started with a essentially a preset, you know, challenge, let's say I didn't have to play all these resource cards and whatnot. And instead, it was just some mechanism where I got 20 runs a game, and I had to use them wisely, and then I would win. Like I, that would still be very appealing to me. That'd be pretty fun. I mean, the corp would be a little less interesting if yeah, like, the certainly. board was just built, because <laughs> how you build your board and the order and all yeah. that kind of stuff, resin and not resin and whatnot. It's a fascinating quip, man. I kind let, let's think about that. Well, because you know, about there, that more. there could actually be a fun solo variant of Netrunner where you set up a corp board mm-hmm. and it's resed, and it's like you give yourself so many actions. To like score seven points. That would be cool. There's like five cards and random five random cards in their hand, mm. a couple random cards installed, and a couple, you know, the decks randomized. And it's yeah. like every turn you get rid of the top card of the deck or something. And it's like anyways, you, you could figure I that love out. That's, it a different, all. that's a different thing. Huh. There's a lot to talk about there. We could that could be a whole topic. Yep. Maybe all we right. make a question one. number four from Steve Void. My question would be, do you think, and this is referencing Netrunner, the community will be strong enough to keep the game alive for events. Will stores still offer tournaments and support for the game, even though there's no more product to sell? So this goes back. This goes back to the the model of the LGS, right? Which has traditionally been, and this is why it skews so heavily towards Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, etc. The idea of the store has become, or rather, I guess it's now kind of leaving that phase, if you ask me. Uh, get players in the store by hosting events and exciting things, and while they're there, they'll buy stuff, and that's how I'm going to make my money. Right, that's yeah. typically been it. Well, traditionally, the word store references a place where you buy things. Certainly, and traditionally, you didn't have any other options. Yeah, you couldn't just it's like the 80s hit a button on your you, phone and then it shows up you can't 20 just get minutes a box. later from a drone. So, yeah, um, the stores who are still operating under that model and that assumption will not host Netrunner tournaments because it's pointless. They don't have product to sell. Why would they host events when the method of profit generation is selling things? Now, secondarily, though, the more new wave stores, uh, more cafe models, and the things that are trying to monetize you being there uh, in different ways as opposed to product sales, or paying for events, or gaming clubs that are taking place at pubs and bars, um, those there's no reason. Anything players want to play, if they'll pay to play it, or pay, to pay for something while they're there, uh, like a beer or a snack or a coffee, then you're just looking for anything that's going to get the most players to your store. Yeah. And if Netrunner is one of those things, because you have 25 people that will show up when you host a Netrunner event, then absolutely, there's no reason to stop hosting it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the tough parts with an expandable game is once you stop expanding, um, general interest wanes, player base wanes. And, and how so, do new players get started? Impossible. That's the problem. Uh, but I won't say impossible, because there's really good examples of this with like the Star Wars CCG. Mm-hmm. That game keeps going. It's the, the engine that could. Um, people still keep playing it. I, I know there's a group in, in Tulsa that's like 15 to 20 people meet up once a month to play the game. Um, so it is possible. I think Netrunner is one of those kind of games. Like the passion for it and the, how much people enjoy it is high enough. And I know there's some pl- player committee stuff going on. Mm-hmm. I've heard her, her grumblings of that. Yeah, we've actually, so there's, there's two more questions. Anthony Pearson had a similar uh, question, a lot of nice things to say about me, or funny things to say about me as well. Uh, and Jason Chung. Uh, with an Ask Kevin again. <laughs> Apparently, I was very emotive during that podcast. I guess Man, that's, that's how emotions like, work. pictures of you are my favorite. <laughs> it's like four screenshots of Steve. Uh, it's just being a I, human. I didn't realize these questions were as related. So, like, Anthony Pearson says, do you see your store still running events, weekly meetups once the game has no new content to sell? And Jason Chung? 
Yeah. It says, my question is, will you continue making efforts in to continue the legacy of Android Netrunner? I saw Tim's name associated with the Nisei project. That's what it's called. And yeah. Steven's enthusiasm for the game could move mountains. Would you ever be involved with fan-based content? And if so, what would you envision that, that to look like? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we answered the first one, right? I mean, um, regarding our store still running... Uh, events slash weekly meetups. I mean, the question is, is that going to get the most players in the space that we can? Um, and if that question is answered with yes, then sure. sure. And I mean, the thing is, we have a lot of players with Netrunner cards. So like, in a lot of ways, the players kind of drive the horse on that, or the, the cart. I guess well, they're the horse in that instance. They pull the cart. Yeah, if there's a yeah, lot of Netrunner is. players that want to play Netrunner, then there's no reason to not host an event and uh, you know make that happen. But at the same time, if are we going to continue to try to get players into Netrunner and new players playing Netrunner? It's like, no, because it's just not possible. Yeah. Uh, we don't have revised core sets to sell them. Yeah, at some point, so, you have, it's sort of like with the data token answer earlier, where it's like, at some point, they will stop moving because mm -hmm. the, the new players can't come in, right? And it, everyone that wants to buy data tokens has bought them. Same thing with core sets and stuff. And so, like, if players keep showing up, like we're we're not going to kick people out for playing Netrunner, right? Exactly. Ever, and this is the same. I think for most stores, it's like if a group of people show up to play Netrunner, they probably aren't getting kicked out. But you can play Netrunner anywhere, right? At the living room table, in a bar, in a coffee shop. So um, I don't expect Netrunner to go away. I think there will be people that play Netrunner for the rest of their lives. It's that kind of game. Yep. Um, and you can treat it just like a board game. But at the same time, uh, you know, if you're wanting the level of support you've been getting from local stores for Netrunner to continue, I would be surprised to see that happen. And especially because, as we mentioned with the Gen Con list, Transformers, Warhammer Champions, Lightseekers, God Tier. Destiny. There's no, there's no shortage of games that can get new players involved that do have exciting content happening, that do have publisher support. So it's very easy for stores to fill that gap with something new and exciting that's coming out rather than try to keep something alive that the publisher has essentially cut off. Yeah. Well, so that's just the hard reality of it. I think, that too, the continuing legacy of Netrunner, right, is, like, the more it leans towards... Because, like, even I think if we locally hosted a once-a-year, like, remember the glory days of yeah, Netrunner, sure. Sunday afternoon, bring your old Netrunner cards, we're going to have a good be time. Huge. I think a lot of people would show up. So there, there's, there's that kind of stuff that could well happen, and I think there will be people that do that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't think the regular recurring normal weekly meetups and regionals and store champs and those kind of tournament event series are anywhere near as likely. And then uh, personally, regarding the Nisei project, uh, I hope that that effort is hugely successful. I think there's precedent for those kinds of community-led efforts to succeed. Um, I'm watching it from afar, uh, essentially, because I no way I will have the time to meaningfully engage in that because, as we said... <laughs> There's a lot of new games coming out. Yeah, we've got uh, Covenant, you know, that takes up a lot of time and is so awesome to uh, problem solve for. And given that Netrunner is probably not a piece of the current problem that we're solving for, that's just where the energy is going to go on other things. So um, I hope that it succeeds, and I will probably participate as a personal uh, participant in minor ways attend events if they show up. But yeah, yeah. but I, I can't. I'm probably not going to be trumpeting it from the uh, from the the high tower, if you will. You might trumpet it. You might just not lead the effort. That's true. You know I, mean? I just can't be super involved. Yeah. I want to be. I assure you, that's, I just can't. Be. That's how I was with. That's the, adult uh, life, isn't it? Star Wars TCG as well. That's what you learn, right? You it's like pick you learn that you just say no to yeah. things that you want to do so much. Well, you got to choose. All right. So hey, we like to end the show with a question for you all to answer. You can leave that in the comments um, on YouTube. Question I have is, we're going to Gen Con in a couple weeks. Man, um, it's coming right up. It, it really is. So what would you like to see? Uh, are there any games that are on your horizon that yeah. we should check out? Even board games as much as we rail on them at the first of the episode. Uh, but what, We what, just what, talked about them. We didn't say anything. Uh, it, was, it was leaning like... Maybe, maybe not for us, but like I think everybody understands that board games are amazing and board gamers are amazing and it's all... It's just a matter of preference. I think it's fair to say that it was fair and balanced. <laughs> but... The hey, truth. you decide. Yeah, man. you decide. Uh, anyways, really though, uh, we're heading to Gen Con. If you're going to be there, be sure to say hi. We'd love to meet you and say hello. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, let us know what you'd like to see. And who knows, we might make those videos or podcasts or, or whatever. So, till next time, keep playing. <laughs>